This is a segment from The Annex, an academic sociology-themed podcast. For more, visit us on the web at theannexpodcast.com. All right, so I uh, I have a banter that, uh, full disclosure, Joe supplied to me because, you know, regular listeners will know Joe does all the work and Leslie and I and the guests just show up and <laughs> talk and then let Joe handle everything else. Um <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, Eric Kleinberg at NYU uh, was reacting to a Wall Street Journal article talking about how uh, people are increasingly lonely and loneliness leads to uh, morbidity, mortality, all sorts of problems. Maybe it's tied into kind of the Case Deaton type stuff of suicide, drug abuse, alcoholism, you know, all those poisoning deaths and suicide deaths, all that sort of thing. And uh, Eric uh tweets a link to the article and says, Dear journalist, loneliness can be dangerous, but living alone is not the same as being lonely. Living alone is not the same as being isolated. Feeling lonely does not mean one is socially isolated. There's no ev- strong evidence we're lonelier than ever. I like that word strong. That's uh, a nice catch all. Uh, and then he says, thanks. And then um, Brad Wilcox uh, at uh, UVA uh, quote tweeted Eric and said, Dear journalist, living alone is associated with more suicide, opioid abuse, poverty, and checks notes, dying alone in a heat wave, mm-hmm. uh, which of course was, you know, Eric's first big book. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's strong evidence we're living alone more than ever. Thanks. So, um, you know, the, it, it's interesting uh, dialogue there, um, in, if for no other reason than that little mic drop moment of basically saying, you know, your own uh, most famous book goes yeah. against your point. Um, but even aside from that, it's, it's kind of an interesting thing. And what I see Eric doing is doing a a style of argument that I'm really not fond of, which is basically invoking existence proofs, um, to counter an argument about a statistical tendency. Mm -hmm. Well, what's it? Can you explain that to me, please? Well, so let's say that I say that, um, uh, education is associated with lower fertility in women. Right. And you say, well, but I know someone, I know a woman who has a PhD and she has five children. Mm-hmm. And OK, so that would demonstrate that uh, education doesn't preclude high fertility among women. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't tell us anything about whether it's statistically associated with it. And to a first approximation, nothing in um, social science is a strictly deterministic relationship. So right. we shouldn't really care about existence proofs. Uh, because nobody's really claiming the contrary. Um, and, you know, it, it is true that loneliness and living alone um, are not uh, synonymous. Same. Yeah, you know, that you can, you know, be in a sole person in your household and still be quite socially engaged and socially connected. But, you know, as I think Brad is pointing out, if you had to bet, you know, uh, living alone is probably associated with being lonely. And, it, it kind of doesn't matter because whether we call it loneliness or living alone and, you know, kind of make the little leap, it's nonetheless the fact that the thing we can directly observe, this concrete fact of are you the only person in your household, is associated with a whole lot of bad outcomes that we would theoretically associate with uh, the subjective psychological experience of loneliness. Right. Here, But here's my issue with that one, right? Like Eric Kleinenberg is arguing against deterministic relationships, right? He's saying like just because you're but, so, alone- but Brad isn't arguing that either. Well, I mean Brad's Brad, not saying that it you – know. Brad seems to be making a more positive assertion, right? He's saying living alone is associated more with these things. Now, I don't know if he's implying that like there's causality there because like there's not. I, I mean, I, I wait. You don't I, think I, there's causality between living alone and killing yourself? Here's here's the thing. <laughs> I I worry. Okay, whenever you have a regression that checks the effects of being married or living alone, right? It's net of what yeah. eight, ten, twelve controls, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like there, in in my mind, there are there is likely to be a lot of omitted variable bias in these things. Like if you're a paranoid schizophrenic, you're probably not going to let's say. I argue the proposition that being being unmarried causes you causes poverty. Like I argue it's associated to my work, right? Mm-hmm. But like if you're a paranoid schizophrenic or you have agoraphobia or like even like if you're a low education person, like there's the potential for a lot of spurious relationships that are being picked up in the marriage effect or in the residual or probably some combination of it, right? So yes, I get that there is a marriage effect. I'm just like 
the quantitative evidence alone just I, I have trouble accepting that the institution of marriage itself is a causal factor, right? Mm-hmm. And, and is sufficiently free of spurious relationships because, like, uh, so technically, we're not talking about marriage. We're talking about living alone. Right. There, there's other ways to, you know, obviously, the the most common way to uh, not be. Actually, I don't know if that's even statistically true, but a very common way and historically the normative way to not be alone is to be married. But you can cohabit, or you can have another member of your household who you're not in a romantic relationship. With, yeah. But I a see what roommate, but I you see children, what you could live with a sibling, you know. But I get Joe's point. I mean, I think what Joe's trying to say is like there's like a selection issue, right? Mm-hmm. Um, into who gets to be in a household of more than one, yeah. right? Um, yeah, and that, that's going to account for some of the variants. But I think there's plenty of people who we can imagine a reasonable counterfactual where they are living with someone. And in that reasonable counterfactual, I think they would have, be less likely to kill themselves, less likely to abuse drugs. You know, yeah, but uh, also, almost mathematically, if the other person is also a wage earner, they would be less likely to experience poverty. But also, mm-hmm. like we had Christine Procheski on a couple of weeks ago, and she found like if somebody starts doing drugs or if they're an alcoholic, mm-hmm. then they're more likely to be divorced. And so they would be alone. But I could see the alcoholism being the causal factor. You know what I, you know, well, alcohol is classically endogenous. And I can quote, uh, you know, the great authority on social science, the Simpsons, where <laughs> Homer says, uh, alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Drew uh, Young, do you got uh, you got uh, any, uh, any thoughts on yeah. this one? Or? Well, it's super interesting to hear you all talk about this. Um, I, you know, like when I read Eric's tweet, I thought he was making a very interesting distinction that, uh, you know, sometimes I think we sort of gloss over. He's saying living alone, which is sort of a status, is not the same as being lonely, which is an emotional state or something that could be a persistent emotional Mm -hmm. state that might be associated with a number of mental health outcomes or issues. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was a pretty interesting thing. And I thought about a lot of, uh, you know, one of my students actually at Toronto is uh, studying how people connect through online gaming communities and he's looking at sort of communities that that crop up around various uh, games that you play with other people like one of them is PUBG it's this uh, battle royale game Um, and he himself you know when he approached me about this project was saying like you know I'm a a lonely person I've sort of always felt that way but being able to game with these people on a regular basis the same people who I've never met but I know their gamer tags they know me they know about my life Mm -hmm has been sort of a, a way that he, I guess, has combat, combated uh, the feeling of loneliness uh, while living right. alone. So I thought that was an interesting distinction that, that Eric was making, at least in his tweet. Yeah. And, and you can form such intense relationships through online gaming communities, you end up, eventually end up swatting your friends. <laughs> oh. Hopefully not. Hopefully oh. not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, so, you know, part, so... Part of like what that tweet actually led me to think about is this piece that I read in the Atlantic. I don't even remember when it came out, but it's fairly recent. Um, and it's the title was the sex recession, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And like, and in reading through the article, I was, you know, part of what I was trying to figure out is like which comes first, mm-hmm. right? So there are all of these lonely people, right? And because they're lonely, they're not having sex, right? Or is it the fact that they're not having sex that makes them feel lonely, right? And it's mm-hmm. this weird mm-hmm. kind of self fulfilling, you know, prophecy, right? Like either like they are like, well, there's a lot of asexual people, first of all. And like, I wonder if. Yeah, if, if it's harder to keep a marriage together when you're asexual, for example, are you thinking along those lines or? No, I mean it's like so. The article basically said everyone seems to be having less less sex yeah. now, right? Yeah. And they were like, "What the heck is that?" Including like the young the youngins, right? They're not ha- they're having a lot less sex, and okay. you know. Uh, uh, there are a variety. I mean, they, I mean, they give a variety of reasons, right? Of course, you know, technology, Mm. right? Um, this push to create new technologies actually that Mm. don't, um, 
that don't necessitate having more than one person be yeah. part of it, right? Um, like they talk about, actually, they, um, like it made me think about uh, Kleinenberg because they actually talked about the book that he co-wrote with Aziz Ansari. And there's that one, that one portion of the book where they're in Tokyo and Ansari goes into like this convenience store and gets this silicone egg that's supposed to be used by guys to, you know, Mm -hmm. um, and, and he, and basically he, you know, I think Ansari's take on it was like, you know what? Right. I get it. I mean, it's not for me, but I get it. Right. It's a way to, you know, get your thing on without having to engage with another person without having to put yourself out there. Right. And, um, and I don't know, that seems like a really, really scary uh, reality. Right. Well, I can tell you my wife who's really going to enjoy this episode. (laughs) (laughs) For more, visit us on the web, theannexpodcast.com.